Well, I've got a very special guest today. I've been really looking forward to this interview. Um, this man is a doctor. His name is Dr. Judson Somerville. And the first time that I heard about him was through a member of rheumatoid support called Erin. And Erin is a much loved member. And she shared about how she read a book called The Optimal Dose. And she was telling other members inside the platform, our uh, discussion platform about it. And so I went and checked it out. And I thought, this is really interesting. So I bought the Audible audio version of Dr. Somerville's book called The Optimal Dose and have read it and found it absolutely fascinating. There is a recent study which um, uh, was published in 2018 and this study in 2018 talks about, it's called the assessment of vitamin D in rheumatoid arthritis and its correlation with disease activity. The main author of this was Dr. Mina, M-E-E-N-A. And it says in the study results that 84% of RA patients were vitamin D deficient and that vitamin D deficiency is more common in rheumatoid patients and maybe one of the causes leading to the development and the worsening of the disease. And so who better to come onto the podcast and to talk about vitamin D and to rock your world about ways in which we should be approaching vitamin D than Dr. Judson Somerville. So thank you, Dr. Somerville. Sure, Clint. I, I appreciate the opportunity. I mean, I really want to get the word out. Now, I'm going, to, uh, I'm going to just read out your bio here because um, I want people to get an understanding of your professional background, and then we're going to get into your personal story as to how you become quite possibly one of the world's leading experts on vitamin D. You've been treating people with high-dose vitamin D, which we'll talk about in a second, um, and, and, and we're going to hear about your, oh, gosh, very... Uh, humbling personal journey with your own health and also your incredible results that you've achieved with high dose vitamin D with your patients and yourself. But first of all, let me just uh, uh, bring everyone up to speed with your background. Uh, you're a seventh generation Texan and after graduating with a chemical engineering degree from the University of Texas, you completed your doctorate at McGovern Medical School in 1988 and began residency training at the University of Massachusetts Medical Center in general surgery, and after two years switched to anesthesiology. In 1994, you began a private practice of anesthesiology in Texas with an emphasis on pain management and opened up the Pain Management Clinic in 1995, and then soon published in numerous publications and became an expert in that field spending the next 23 years helping people cope with chronic pain. And whilst in your anesthesiology residency training in 1990, you were involved in a severe bicycle accident that resulted in becoming paraplegic and wheelchair bound. And you're the first person to suffer such an injury and still complete the rigorous training of medical residency. You have encountered many challenges since then, and those trials have led to becoming a, uh, into a unique cap capability as both a physician and a patient, and with emphasis on patients under your care to understand their encounters on both a professional and personal level, and to be able to offer sound advice. And now you have recently published a book called The Optimal Dose, which is educating people around vitamin D and deficiency. So thank you again for joining us. Let's now get stuck into it. Um, tell us, how did, uh, how did this all begin for you? I mean, we heard your background there, but um, why, how did the uh, vitamin D exploration all eventuate? Well, my mom had always been into vitamins and such, so I grew up with them all, all my life. And um, I mean, numerous stories, like when they uh, operated on me for my spine surgery, they said they'd never seen such amazing bones. And I attribute that to the probably cod liver oil my mother stuffed down my throat. Anyway, fast forward, I was, uh, after being paralyzed, I was bitten by a brown recluse spider and dying. Okay. Lots of possible admissions, all kinds of necrotizing fasciitis, just a mess. I also, um, after my bicycle accident, as I mentioned earlier, developed an autoimmune disease, which I didn't realize until recently was connected. And so um, I was dying. I needed something. I came across an article about vitamin D and I started experimenting with it. Mm. 
Now, hang on. You just said some like major stuff in a short few sentences there. You said you actually died. So no, they I had almost to... died probably multiple times. Wow. Multiple times. Wow. Okay. Uh, and you said that you also, and, and so was that related to the spider? Or was it related to the awful bike accident that left you in a wheelchair? I mean, what, how do we, how do we, uh, which, which part there contributed the greatest? I think I was probably severely vitamin D deficient because I used to exercise a lot and get in the sun. And so I wasn't exercising, which boosts your vitamin D receptors tremendously. That's why a lot of people that exercise get a lot of the same benefits, just not the immune response that people that take high dose vitamin D. And um, so I, I was low in vitamin D. My immune system was low. And just the, the spider bite caused me to be septic. I ended up with necrotizing fasciitis. I think the autoimmune disease also suppressed me and caused me issues. So I was just really in, in for having really good genes, I was in horrible condition. It was just perfect storm. In your book, which I found tremendously fascinating, you were talking about the impact of that spider bite, which for you in your unique circumstances was very, very detrimental because of the lack of feeling in your leg. And therefore, you weren't able to identify until there was more development, I guess, that the bite had occurred and what had caused a lot of problems until a little bit further along than what maybe another person would have. And that then the treatment of that, it was grotesque. You were talking about how you know trying to have that wound uh, cleaned on a regular basis and it required a lot of time and it was, I mean, how did you, I mean, it really was hard to listen to at times. I mean, you went through extreme personal challenge for many years with that impact of that spider bite. I mean, I don't know if you have children or not, but, yes. you know, I, as a parent, it's interesting. I, I realized until recently, I really hadn't had time to focus on me my whole life because you know, you do what you have to do to take care of your family. And my family was super critical. And I just knew I had things I needed to do and wanted to do. Mm. And I wasn't mm. going to let anything get in my way. The same as mm. like getting through residency and everything that happened mm. before, you know, life is tough and you just have to deal with it, you know? Mm. Yeah. Extraordinary. Extraordinary. Um, and then, uh, it, Let's just uh, fast forward your story then. You were beginning to experiment and you did high dosing of vitamin D and uh, you, you know, with relentless determination, eventually overcame that particular aspect of, of life's challenge for you. Yes. Um, and this was one of the uh, big revelations for you about high dosing of vitamin D. Is that accurate? Yes. I mean, it saved my life because when I, about two years before I started, I figured I had three to five years to live. I mean, I was just, I was hundred pounds overweight, sleep apnea. I had uh, gastric reflux. I was getting urinary tract infections, wound infections. Um, you know, I, my nutrition was horrible. I, I was, I was, I knew I, it only would take one big hit and I was a goner. And, um, you know, I stumbled on vitamin D you know, one for my mom. So I looked for natural solutions. Two, I saw an article in the newspaper about the benefits other than bone health, because in medical school, they don't teach you anything really about vitamins other than to be afraid of fat soluble ones, which is wrong. And besides vitamin D isn't even a vitamin, it's, it's a hormone. And so anyway, um, I uh, started experimenting on myself and then my patients and finally found that 30,000 units, international units a day was the optimal dose. I tried higher doses later on myself. And I really, you know, just for as a regular daily dose, I didn't see any additional benefits. Mm -hmm. Okay. So yes, you've, you've uh, given away the, uh, the magic number that you talk about in your book, which is yes. this optimal dose of 30,000 international units a day. And this is a huge number. Now, when we uh, when we look at the guidelines, both you know in Australia and the US, which are probably typical around the world, uh, correct me, uh, is it around about the seven hundred international unit mark? In the US, it's six hundred, depending upon the age. I don't remember all the specifics, but I think maybe if you're pregnant more and as a child less. But yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you found 
that there is a number that is way higher than what we are typically told to, uh, to, to supplement with, say, or to reach each day. And so for the rest of our conversation, let's get into why and let's explore why is this the case and why did you come up with this number and why have you found that that is the optimal dose? And we'll get into that. Before we do, you mentioned it's not a vitamin. What exactly is vitamin D? It's, it's a, what's called a seco hormone. It's, it's, it's actually a hormone because vitamins, by definition, you can't produce in your body, okay? Now, a lot of the B vitamins, the gut microbiota produces, or you can take them, but there's no, it's not like you can get exposed to sun and produce them. With vitamin D, uh, sun exposure produces vitamin D. And so it's the same, same form as you buy in a supplement, then it's converted in your liver uh, to the blood storage form, and then in your kidneys or inside the cells, and that's the kicker, uh, into the active form. Okay. So can we eliminate, first of all, one particular sort of uh, uh, limiting belief, which would be, does vitamin D through supplement have an equivalent effectiveness as vitamin D from the sun? Can we tick that box and say we can supplement happily? Yes, they're equal. Okay. Beautiful. Okay. And we've established that it's a hormone. Um, Now, how did they make a mistake to call a vitamin a hormone? Is this something that happens with any other vitamin or is it just this one? Just this one. It's really kind of interesting, you know? And actually, um, I had, I went to a a parts store one time and this guy behind the counter and I was telling about vitamin D because I tell everybody. He goes, oh yeah, well, what's vitamin D1? I didn't know. Well, it turns out there isn't one. It's nothing. It was a mistake. It was a combination of D2 and D3. And then when they finally realized it, they did T2, which is, you know, the mushroom ergo cholecalciferol. And then D3 is cholecalciferol. So there is no D1. It's interesting. You give the background of the uh, evolution of the development of the um, international unit recommendation in your book. You talk about how it came about. And what you point out is that. that they basically set the amount that's needed for us each day to avoid rickets and nothing more. Can you talk about this a little more? Yeah, I mean, uh, I, I have reference in my book, the article where, because really blood levels are what you want to get to in 100 to 140 nanograms per ml. And in most labs, above 100 is considered possibly toxic. Well, the people that did that knew it wasn't. And, you know, um, on my blog, I explain how there's a genetic defect that some people is extremely rare and usually diagnosed at birth can develop hypercalcemia. Of, of note, no one has ever died from vitamin D induced hypercalcemia. At the time, they didn't understand all the different things it could do. And I don't know um, why they never readjusted it because over years, more and more research, and from what I learned recently, um, uh, just in the last week or so, is that in fact that they, um, had used vitamin D to treat cancer back in the 30s or 40s. Now, I can't find any articles. I have a hard time finding articles sometimes anyway, which is kind of interesting. Um, But yeah, they didn't really understand it was good for anything other than rickets. So they dosed it just to treat that. And they missed everything else. And really, um, I mean, I don't want to say the pharmaceutical industry is trying to block this, but I'll say the pharmaceutical industry is trying to block this because basically, and this sounds crazy, if you look at my hair, you maybe think I am, um, almost every disease we get is a function of vitamin D deficiency. Yeah. Okay, great. Can you elaborate on that a little bit more? I know, bold statements. Well, you know, you're, you're, you're into autoimmune diseases yeah. and the thymic, th- uh, let me see if I get this right, the thymic Stromal lipopoietin is a critical substance that causes inflammation or not in the gut lining and epithelial lining. Vitamin D modulates it. So if you're deficient in it, whammo, you have an issue. The other thing is vitamin D is super critical because the thing I found most consistent was its effect on the immune system because no one ever got the flu again after I took it. Well, your gut is controlled by your immune system and it's controlled by vitamin D because Depending on the back, certain bacteria promote and certain bacteria depress the activity of other bacteria and other substances or other organisms to produce more or less of the substances needed, serotonin, GABIN, whatever it is. Um, and so 
if you don't have enough vitamin D, you basically have a gut that is really sick and you end up with gaps instead of buttons. And so basically poop leaks into your arteries. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This concept of intestinal permeability or leaky gut. And what also happens is some the the when you have a low vitamin D, this is really the most important thing I've learned as far as immune system. Your your immune system is blinded when you don't have enough vitamin D because there's things called dendritic cells, and dendritic cells differentiate self from foreign, but they need vitamin D in order to function. And if you don't have vitamin D, the system is blinded. I think that's one of the causes for autism, for cytochrome storm for these diseases where you just get a massive, your body throws everything it can at this, it knows something's wrong, it knows it needs to do something to help pr protect itself. And all it has is to just throw everything at it. And unfortunately yeah. it kills people or destroys their brains. Yeah, that's fascinating. I've never heard that before, that the possibility of all the, all the, all the fact that the vitamin D influences that differentiation mechanism and the ability to discern self from pathogen. And that's, that's fascinating. So, okay, we're, we're getting excited about this. Um, now, why are most of us deficient? Why do you think that, uh, you know, what happened? How did everyone become so low? Well, it, it's, um, oh, what's the word I want to use? Um, I, I'll just say it. We, we, we like clothes. We don't like being in the sun. And we like sun. They, they sold us to, I mean, they told us two things. One, to avoid salt, which is iodine, which is a whole other subject, which is going to kill us. But they also told us to avoid sun and uh, wear sunscreen. Well, sunscreens, you know, are not good. And I blog about that and the substance they contain and how dangerous many of them are. So we wear sunscreen. Wake, makeup has sunscreen, especially if you have darker pigmentation. And we were taught in medical school that the reason Hispanics and Blacks, people of color, have more high blood pressure, diabetes, uh, obesity, and, and all these other diseases is a genetic defect. That is racist garbage. Because what it is, is lack of vitamin D. Because with the dark pigmentation, they require a lot more sun. And most people of color don't go out in the sun. And so that's caused their issues. People with lighter skin, we wear clothes, we stay inside. You know, we've, give, we've given up on loincloths, okay? Yeah. And, and also, the further you move from the equator, the more the UV index, which is ultraviolet light, the B fraction is critical to producing vitamin D, okay, in the skin. Well, the further you move, the more likely that, um, I mean, some areas up north, there's the zero UV index. So even if you went and sunbathed, for what little sun there is, you would get zero vitamin D. Wow. And it is yep. fat soluble, but I, I think that's kind of, you know, everybody's like, oh, it's fat soluble. You'll store it and it'll cause some kind of issue. Uh, what issue? Uh, and I think most people are probably, I'm getting off on all kinds. I mean, it, it's, I'm so excited about it. And there's so much to talk about. I could go on forever, but uh, yeah, yeah, let, 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 your question, let, that's it. Yeah. Let me hold you there because we're going to talk about the concepts of uh, toxicity. We're going to, and I want to spend a lot of time on that in a moment. I'm going to really pick your brain on that. I really want us to feel uh, educated and confident if we go ahead and follow uh, some of your recommendations or even try and bridge the gap from where people are now and, and where you recommend. So we're going to go into all that in just a second. Sure. Um, I just was fascinated by the concept of uh, you know, uh, people with darker skin and how they're more likely to be vitamin D deficient because they, A, don't go in the sun uh, as much, you said, and also that they don't absorb or convert uh, as much into vitamin D because I guess, no, I learned from your book that if you've got darker skin, that um, isn't it kind of uh, almost like a uh, biological evolution of having spent a lot of time outdoors and your body develops an ability to be protective of itself because it assumes with darker skin that you are going to be out in the sun a lot. Have I understood that correctly? With really intense ultraviolet light, you know, the equator, you know, what I call the golden band between the Tropic of Capricorn and the Tropic of Cancer, basically it's a high UV all year round. Okay. And yeah. so melanin absorbs, I forget, like 99.8% of ultraviolet light. 
that ultraviolet light doesn't produce vitamin D. So the more you have, the more you need to get an off chance to produce vitamin D. Okay. Now let me understand that too, please. So what happens then is we've got the UVA and the UVB coming down from the from radiation from the sun. Mm -hmm. And if we spend time outdoors, we're not just getting the visible sunlight, but we're getting the UV rays and we're also getting the you know infrared rays. And is it the UVB that activates the uh, increase of this hormone, the vitamin D? It converts, uh, I think it's seven uh, dehydroxy cholesterol into vitamin D. Okay. Okay. And so for lighter skin folks like myself, we are going to convert a little quicker because our body is just light skin. Is that correct? Right. We're not, we don't have melanin absorbing it. And the reason we get a tan is to try to compensate because our body said, Hey, we're getting a lot of this. Let's up the, cut it down a little bit because, you know, I mean, I've heard different theories and, and, I almost wrote a chapter on it, but trying to com- trying to figure out for every different skin shade and how much exposure and what UV, it's impossible. But basically, if you're light skin, spend, spend a half an hour, 25 minutes, 20 minutes in the sun during uh, a high UV tin, you produce 25,000 units. And, and that is crucial. And I want us just to dwell on that for a moment. You're saying that less than half an hour in the sun for most people during the middle of the day in say, uh, you know, a warm, warm summer day or warm spring day, they're going to get around about 25 interna- 25,000 international units of vitamin D from that in a natural way, correct? Correct. Okay. So if we wind back a little bit and say that your recommended dose of 30,000 international units per day for human beings yes. makes complete sense because it's kind of what you would get if we weren't sitting indoors all day typing at our computer or, um, you know, putting sunscreen all over us the moment that we put our face out in the sun, correct? Exactly. Exactly. And so once I learned that, it gave me a lot of confidence, like, hey, it's not that different, you know? And I mean, if somebody in light skin was spending a lot of time in the sun, probably spent more than 30 minutes. Most definitely. And, and if we wind back the, the human existence before the Industrial Revolution, you know, you spoke about this in your book. Um, you know, what we would have done? We would have been outdoors much more. With much less clothing. Yeah. No sunscreen. Yeah, right. So, um, you know. And so it's not possible to overdose on uh, vitamin D derived naturally, is it? You know what? There's no, and that's a great point, Clint. There's not a single case documented that I know of where somebody overdosed from sun exposure to, you know, for vitamin D3. None. Yeah, it's like never happened. I mean, it's yeah. possible if somebody has that genetic defect and all those things, but the regular person, no, absolutely zero. Okay. All right. So we've learned all this now about, you know, the sort of mechanisms behind this and what vitamin D is. And we've talked about some health benefits and there's one huge big one that I want us to touch upon in just a second, uh, which is sleep. Um, and and we'll, we'll get on that in a second. Um, but why is everyone so concerned about the toxicity and why? And when I say everyone, let me be a little bit more specific here. Doctors that I highly respect, who I send people to for consultations when they need help with medications and, uh, um, you know, just uh, guidelines that you'll read online about, you know, vitamin D levels. It, there's always this almost like, you now you got to be careful, like don't get it too high. And I, I just, I, having listened to your book from start to finish, it now makes me actually a little bit annoyed with these recommendations. And it, is it just is it is it um oh, is it justified to have such concern about these these levels? Well, you know, I mean, with anything you want to be careful. You don't want to be cavalier and, and dumb. I mean, you might have that genetic defect and not know it. I mean, I think there's only a handful of cases of people that didn't know they had it and were diagnosed as an adult. Okay, so uh, and yet you have people in cashmere getting millions of units a day, and there's only a handful of cases of people getting hypercalcemia. So I think I'm kind of starting to work on this theory that if you have a normal CYP 
24A1 gene in both alleles, both chromosomes, that it's almost impossible to get hypercalcemia. Okay. Right. I, I don't know that for a fact, but, you know, I think the people that do get it are having some degraded function in that, and they can't, they can't destroy the active form. So their active form goes up, and that's where the issue. But anyway, um, it is annoying. And in a medical school, they only spent maybe five minutes on vitamins. They lump vitamin D in with fat soluble vitamins and that they're all dangerous and stay away from them. And they showed us pictures of people in third world people with their skin falling off as a result of too much fat soluble vitamin. And so, you know, that was the image we were left with. And then if you go into society and everywhere else, it's just constantly reinforced vitamin D, fat soluble, bad. And it's not a vitamin and it's a myth. It's a total myth. And um, it's kind of interesting when people try to argue with me about that because uh, they really don't have any ground to stand on because it's a myth. And it's, it's really unfortunate because it keeps a lot of people, um, and it's made it a lot more harder to educate people because you have to overcome that preconceived conception, you know, and perception is reality. People say, well, you know, what do you know? How do you know? And then you have to go into a, a pretty complex explanation to, to beat down the argument. So like I can say, well, it's not that, you know. Mm. And I think something that you pointed out in your book, which makes it very challenging, is that all the studies that have ever been done on vitamin D and their health benefits and so on, they're all being done on what you consider to be extremely low dose. And so the fact that we're considering people with RA vit uh, vitamin D deficient when, uh, you know, 84% of them are, are deficient by the standards that, you know, you describe as extremely low, imagine how deficient they are in the scale in which you believe is appropriate. I mean, extremely deficient. And that's why, I mean, I, I don't know how old you are, Clint. I'm 59. But when I was a kid, people were a lot healthier. They didn't have as many autoimmune diseases. There wasn't as much obesity, you know, sleep uh, apnea, all these issues that are directly linked to vitamin D deficiency. You know, mm. people went to the beach, they got sun. And actually, um, you know, I just did a blog post, three of nine are out that vitamin D is critical to curing cancer. So if you have enough vitamin D, you're not going to get skin cancer unless you have a genetic defect that really predisposes it to you. Actually, the high dose of vitamin D will actually cure it. Mm -hmm. And as you said, we don't have the studies for that because no one's ever run the studies at the levels that you consider optimal. And so we don't know because the test has never been done at the level and appropriate scale that, that, that represents what would be the, the therapeutic dose. Exactly, exactly. Now, uh, I have a really good friend of mine from India. Uh, he and his group just got a study approved to be funded by the Indian government to go with COVID in my doses, 30,000 awesome. I use a day. Awesome. Yeah, that's exciting, isn't it? Yes, very exciting. Yes. Very exciting. Yes, so, very exciting. You know, I mean, the thing is to get some literature out there. There is one study, a Japanese study, that used 25,000 units, vitamin K2, and uh, 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 I'm blanking on the substance, to treat osteoporosis and saw a significant improvement in it. But that's the only study I've ever found that uses a dose close to what I recommend. Mm -hmm. Interesting. I've seen some, you know, on diff, uh, stepping outside of vitamin D for a second, I've noticed with some, uh, with a study with rheumatoid arthritis, they did some very high dosing of potassium, um, which, um, you know, again, I've, I've had pushback when I've referenced people to that study and said, you know, check this with your doctor because potassium is clearly linked to rheumatoid arthritis activity. And then the doctors in some instances have said, no, I don't want you to do that. I think that that's unsafe or whatever. And yet even in that uh, instance, a, a group of humans were taken through that study with those high doses. And, and so it's not like this. Yeah. Anyway, my point being is that conservatism definitely reigns. And that's what we are trying to uh, address in this conversation and what you right. are constantly battling in your career um, with this recommendation. Speaking of that, Tell us about the experience that your patients have had when shifting to this high 
dose of, or let's call it the optimal dose, I should say, of 30,000 international units per day. It's, it's interesting. You know, I did it for bone health and I did it for sleep. Okay. And um, I started noticing some other things. I noticed uh, that people started losing weight or not gaining more weight. I lost about 80 to 100 pounds because whereas before I could eat a huge meal and still be hungry, which drove me crazy. I didn't understand how can I be fat and still be hungry, but knowing, you know, and what kills diets, your appetite and vitamin D at optimal doses suppresses those and boosts your metabolism 20, 30% and blocks fat absorption of the fats you don't need. Okay. The other thing I found, and one lady, as I put it in my book, lost 200 pounds, you know, and I didn't even notice it was so subtle. I had probably a dozen guys lose 75 pounds in three months. And none of these people changed their app. I mean, they just, they changed their diet or were trying to lose weight. It just happened. Okay. The other thing that happened is, is like I say in my book, I, when I first started, I went home, I went to sleep. It was light outside. I was really tired. And uh, the next thing I know, I wake up and it's still light outside. And I thought I'd slept for a minute. It was 10 hours. Wow. Wow. So, and then the, uh, the most amazing thing and probably the most consistent thing is that um, the immune effects, I mean, people's wounds started healing faster um, that hadn't been healing at all. And mm. that nobody again ever got the flu, ever, ever mm. got the flu. And this and, is all uh, your, this is, this is your patients that now take the optimal dose. It was, it blew me away because, you know, until you start doing it, fortunately, I had thousands of people taking it. So I had a, a, a lot of, you know, different, I mean, it's Laredo, it's mostly Hispanic. But, you know, the United States, the genetics are so dis- dispersed. I mean, so, so many different genetic lines in the United States. I'm not very articulate mm-hmm. today. That, you know, you're going to run across probably almost every possible genetic combination there is out there. Um, Laredo being, you know, kind of isolated was a little bit less so that way. But treating all those patients I did, I did get, a, I think, a pretty good representation. Yeah. And I just want to echo that because in case someone's on their treadmill or they're in their car and they had someone tooted the horn, let me just repeat that you have given this optimal dose to thousands of people have taken 30,000 international units per day. And what you've seen consistently is a, uh, in your book, you describe a, a reaching more of a suitable body weight for that person. So people find it, that they can lose weight steadily, naturally, without it being sort of a, one of these like crazy shed diets. Um, mm-hmm. And also uh, the sleep side of thing has been tremendous for yourself and also your patients. Um, some people are going to be scratching their head uh, about how the body can lose weight naturally. And you talked about the appetite sort of normalization of appetite and a concept in your book that explains this is the um winter syndrome would you mind please giving us a taster of what the winter syndrome is because it's a fascinating concept and i've found myself thinking that phrase several times well you know i got to thinking about what do animals do in particular let's say grizzly bears up in alaska in, um, they need to make it through the whole winter because they hibernate. Well, before they hibernate, they pig out, okay? They eat and eat and eat and eat. And why? Because their vitamin D level drops as the sun drops because they produce their vitamin D on their fur. And, you know, animals are always cleaning themselves because, of course, animals want to be clean. No, it's because there's vitamin D there, and vitamin D gives off endorphins when you ingest it. And they actually made rats addicted to sunlight. Okay. (laughs) And so, you know, you get a dopamine hit when you get more vitamin D. And so what happens is as their vitamin D levels drop, their appetite goes up, their metabolism slows down and and their fat absorption goes up. So basically, as I put it, you want to eat fat rolled in sugar, the most calorically dense thing you can, and as much of it as you can. Right. So then then the spring comes around, you start getting vitamin D again, you know, you have to gain some weight because they've lost muscle and stuff, but then they get to ideal body weight and they stay that way because they need to be fast and quick in the summer to go catch things and eat it and stuff like that and defend themselves. In the winter, they just need to be able to go survive it. Yes. And so 
Um, just close that out with how you see humans that are perpetually in winter syndrome. Exactly, because we don't ever get the spring because we never boost our vitamin D levels up. And your body wasn't meant to do that. And that's why you end up with all these health issues. I mean, it's not healthy to hibernate, but it's what you have to do to survive, okay? And for a human to basically be in a semi-hibernation period, a winter syndrome for decades just ends up, you know, destroying their health. You know, their gut gets altered and, um, you know, because their immune system is critical to keeping the barrier to protect and get the right combination of organisms in your gut. Yes. Yes. Yeah, I love it. So with the, with the winter syndrome, folks are thinking because they're vitamin D deficient that it, we, we must, because we're another animal, I mean, we are, look different and we don't have as much fur as the, uh, as the bear or we have a different sort of hair on our skin. Right. We, we, but biologically, the body thinks, oh, you know, it is cold uh, because there's no uh, vitamin D being produced. We therefore must be in a let's eat and sort of get ready for cold times vibe or, of situation rather than a feeling of there's ample vitamin D. I'm therefore going to be active. Food is going to be abundant in fruits and vegetables and natural things that I can source easily. And I don't need to hold on to all of this extra calories that I'm consuming. Exactly. Exactly. Mm. Very mm. well said. It's a great concept. Um, and, uh, you know, one thing that I've noticed just to, you know, wind back just a fraction onto the sleep and, and we are really covering a lot of content here and, and, and certainly not doing the book justice. We're just touching on sort of the surface on a lot of these topics. Um, but, uh, you know, what I've noticed and I've started to um, incrementally increase my vitamin D dosage since reading your book um, limited partly because a lot of the supplement companies only sell like a thousand international units in this per supplement and you get sick of popping like 20 of them. Um, but you know, I, um, uh, I've been incrementally in increasing it and I have noticed quite dramatically the improvement to my sleep. That has been the single thing that I've said to my wife, you know what, my sleep is much better. And this is something again, that you really, really uh, pursued in your own journey, wasn't it? Your lack of sleep. Yeah, I, it was killing me. I mean, because I, uh, I'm the kind of person, I guess I'm just always thinking and I need to kind of shut that off. And if I can't sleep, it just exhausts me. I don't know yeah. how other people feel, but for me, yeah. it's just so draining. And uh, I, uh, I don't like doing without my sleep. And would you give us the uh, explanation that you did in the book about the way that the vitamin D allows the body to get into more of a, um, uh, or it shuts down some of those movement responses that we ah, have? Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Um, and I love this because uh, recently they discovered what's called the glymphatic drainage system. And it's, a, and it's amazing they discovered something new that's anatomical in the 21st century. I mean, it really is as much as many dissections and stuff, but it basically it's a small set of drainage pipes, kind of like the lymphatic drainage system in your body. It's kind of like veins, but um, the lymphatics for fats, but in your brain, it's for the, to try to offload, clean out all the garbage in your brain, the larger particles and such. Well, your brain needs to be contracted 30 to 40% to do that. And so when you're deep asleep, you need to be totally paralyzed except for your breathing. And vitamin D3 controls that. So if you don't have it, it goes wacko. And you start becoming more paralyzed snoring and more paralyzed sleep apnea and or less and less paralyzed restless leg syndrome. So you're constantly waking up to go pee, okay? And, you know, I ask people that, well, yeah, I wake up five times a night because I have to have pee. And I go, well, do you have swollen legs or heart condition? And they go, no. And I say, do you pee every two hours during the day? And they go, no. I said, so why would you do it during the night? Okay. And so anyway, when your brain contracts, it opens up the system. It can pump out the garbage. And my thought is dementia, Alzheimer's, Parkinson, a lot, a lot of these diseases are because they never get that deep sleep. They never brain never can contract and then never can pump out the junk, okay? Also, it allows your body, the stem cells and the hormones to repair damaged tissue. Now, 
athletes, you know how these athletes get these head injuries and stuff and then end up with a lot of problems at a younger age. I think they damage the lymphatic drainage system. So even if they get deep sleep, they can't drain the garbage out and it accumulates faster on them. And so they end up with issues earlier in age. Mm, mm. Okay. Um, and you mentioned that the vitamin D uh, uh, helps us to get into our deepest sleep, the more restorative sleep that you described, because it allows our body to get into more of a paralyzed, a self-paralyzed state of, of stillness. Right. REM sleep, you know, and just able to, you know, because you need to get that in order to reorganize all the information you learned that day. And your brain will function better if it's better organized. But if you don't get that deep sleep, you can't, if it keeps on getting interrupted, it can't download that, condense it, you know. Um, and so your brain ends up functioning not as well. You can even end up with brain fog. Mm. Oh, yeah, no doubt. And when you have an autoimmune disease and you uh, are in physical pain, it certainly also interrupts your sleep throughout the night. Um, and you have this morning stiffness that uh, uh, begins through the night. It's not like suddenly at 7 a.m. that's when it begins. It's just a slow, more of a, a buildup of stiffening throughout the night. So, um, you know, these discomforts and these concerns and worries and uh, it all contributes to poor sleep. And then on top of that, knowing from the studies that everyone's vitamin D deficient by the most conservative standard, uh, no wonder folks with autoimmune conditions are feeling exhausted all the time on top of the medications and on top of the overactive immune system. So we got to do something about it. So let's talk about an action plan here. Can you well, can I say some... one thing? Um, yeah. I, was, I treat chronic pain and I was the largest prescriber of antidepressants in the five state region. And after I started the vitamin D and I added krill oil to it for a day, um, I rarely ever wrote an antidepressant again. And I wrote them for sleep and to help with the depressive symptoms from pain. So it's basically the body's natural antidepressant. It's, it's incredible. It's incredible. I've heard that also of vitamin C. I've heard of high dose of vitamin C being antidepressive as well. Have you uh, come across that too? I'm not familiar with that. No, no. Okay. Well, um, that is, uh, that is fantastic. So what do you prescribe to your patients when you say, okay, we're going to do 30,000 international units per day. Uh, do you ramp them up? Do you go straight onto that? Which product specifically do you recommend? Um, and so forth. You know, um, I've been approached by companies to, to you know, yeah. whatever. I, I just, I think you need to find a good brand um, and find one that's an olive oil or avocado oil. You don't want to use seed oil um, as far as that goes. And if you get that, that'll be sufficient. And I just start them flat out on the dose. I mean, every now and then somebody will get some constipation. But what I do is I start them on vitamin D 30,000. And I start them on magnesium, 400 milligrams, and have them ramp it up as much as they could tolerate before they get like loose stools. Wow. But, okay. but you know, in a regular pace, because magnesium is the body's volume. Okay. And it's also critical for bone, a ton of other things. We could talk another hour about it. And then vitamin K2. Now, this is the thing that People have attacked me about, well, you don't talk about vitamin K2, you know, we need it, da, 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 da. And yeah, maybe, but it's, it's just way oversold and it can be dangerous actually because it can stiffen the arteries. Uh, a colleague and I have, uh, well, he's been doing the studies and educated me on it. Doses above 100 micrograms can be detrimental. So you really don't want to take a lot and your gut actually produces vitamin K2 if it's healthy. The other thing is boron. Uh, which is super important for bone health and it helps prevent uh, joint pain and such. And then um, selenium's good. Zinc is good. Again, you want to be careful of doses. And then uh, what else? What else? The krill oil. And that's pretty much it. If, so you've listed a lot of things there um, that I haven't looked into at all um, and haven't learned from you about because most of your books about the vitamin D. Uh, so if we were to say, you know, one step at a time and then refer back to you, what you've just said at a later time and just wanted to get started on the most sort of fundamental, which would be the vitamin D, 
you're suggesting a product um, of the consumer's choice, not one in particular, uh, and you would suggest that it's suspended in olive or avocado oil inside right. a right. capsule yes. and that they should also take magnesium alongside it, starting with 400 milligram Those once are a two day. critical things. Those are the two. Yeah. If you're there, I mean, because I try not to overload people because yeah. they start glassing over and I've already <laughs> blown their mind with a vitamin D and they're barely able to breathe. And so, you know, and I could be kind of intense, you know, and since I've <laughs> been so into it, it's like, you know, I've always kind of been this way. Uh, poor people have to listen to me. Um, but I've learned to kind of shut up sometimes. Um, but the magnesium and the vitamin D are the two critical things to start with. With the magnesium, should that be ramped up as well, um, depending on stool yes, consistency? that should be ramped up. And magnesium glycine is probably one of the better ones. Theonate is supposed to be better for the brain. There's several different types. Oxalate is better for, for constipation. And so, um, you know, somebody that maybe takes a vitamin D and has constipation might just want to use the oxalate, magnesium oxalate, to kind of keep things. Because what I think happens in those rare people is their gut microbiota is so uh, unhealthy, the vitamin D kills everything, so nothing really moves anymore. Oh, in a sense that the vitamin D then establishes a correct order of proceedings with the microbes, meaning that if everything's all bad, then all the bad stuff goes and you're left with none, not much bacteria at all because there's not much good stuff. And so no fermentation, no metabolizing of the fiber goes, goes ahead and you've got nothing to, to move the stools through. See, I'm, I, it's funny you should contact me because right now I'm starting to work on, you know, I just finished the cancer one and my next one was the gut, you know, because it's the second brain and how the vitamin E, because I've been percolating my brain for years, but it's starting to become clearer and clearer to me what's going on there. Yeah. Yeah. That is fascinating. Okay. Brilliant. Um, and what should people expect over the first, say, three, four weeks of doing this? Sleep is probably the first thing they'll notice. Okay. And um, they'll also notice that they eat a lot less. OK, and, you know, I mean, if they have really bad allergies or such, they're going to notice, hmm, they're going away. They're not as bad. I don't have them anymore, mm. you know, and uh, as time goes on, I've been doing it now almost 10 years. I used to have really bad acne scars on my face. They're mostly gone. Same with my arms from the sun. They're much, much better. So I think and this is a, we could like I say, talk forever. And the reason I wrote the book and the blog has a lot of the other supplements and other information that I just couldn't put in the book um, because I wanted to be on vitamin D. And some of the stuff I've learned since I did the book because mm. nobody knew about it until now. Um, but um, yeah, it, it, I think it, it works on your telomeres, the end of your chromosomes. I think it slows down, you know, it might even reverse aging. Well, I was going to actually say that if it were to come up, but your skin looks really, really smooth and clear and very free of wrinkles and so forth. Um, you've, uh, uh, you know, definitely uh, you're looking well, especially, and if I don't mean to this to come across the wrong way, but if you don't have the um, ability with your lower legs to do conventional exercise, then that is even a, even a greater testimonial to, you know, your lifestyle choices. It's, it's, I mean, because I had somebody for the first time in my life say, oh, you have such great skin. And I was like, all my life, it was acne pocked and horrible. And I'm like, wow. Yeah. Wow. And my hair, I mean, genetics, yeah. but I think a lot of it is starting to turn black again. Wow. Wow. It's the crazy. only time... Only time I've ever achieved that one time was when on a completely raw vegan diet and I was, my entire intake were raw, rich foods of fruits and vegetables and I didn't cook anything, right? And so even my nuts were activated, soaked and activated seeds. And I actually recorded a video at the time of myself, which I've never shared publicly, but it'd be interesting for people to see. Uh, I saw some return of blackness into some of the earlier graying that I had going on about maybe seven or eight years ago. Um, and so, yeah, I'm, uh, I'm definitely into uh, anything that will reverse the trends on that for me as well. And it prevents hair loss because 
your hair is on a six-year cycle and vitamin D is intermittently involved in that six-year cycle. And, um, you know, they say your cells turn over every six years. That's not really true, but you do get a lot of turnover in cells. And the healthier your cells could be, the less, you know, infections, the less viral problems, the less damage they get, the more good cells you have and the more it can go to making you your optimal self instead of trying to fight off disease. Mm, yeah, fascinating. Okay, well, you've motivated us to a 10 out of 10 to go and uh, get started on this. Let's now just put ourselves in the position of someone who's listened or watched this interview. They right. now go and they find the appropriate supplements that you've discussed. They start doing it. And then they see their doctor and they run a blood test because they're on methotrexate and they need to get their bloods done every month. And it shows up that their vitamin D is now quite high. And the doctor says, what are you doing with your vitamin D? It, it looks high. You better stop doing that. What, what, what happens in that moment so that we can forward think this situation and manage it? Well, um, Reagan, President Reagan, I mean, uh, did good and bad things. But one thing he said is say the worst first. And I think, you know, first, I'm not giving medical advice. I'm just, this is my personal experiences we're talking about today. And the second is ideally you work with a doctor that gets it, okay? And if they don't, you educate them. Because look, this is why I tell some of the doctors that are like, you know, a little bit skeptical. I go, eventually this is going to be the way everything's done. And so do you want to be the first that does it or not? And a lot are like thinking, well, if I get everybody well, I won't have any business. And I found that my business tripled because if you do the right thing for people, they still have medical issues. You can't get rid of everything. You can't cure everything. I mean, vitamin D, even if you take all you can, you're going to have genetic defects or this or that. All it's trying to do is make the most of what you have, okay? And so if you can work with your doctor and educate them, maybe give them a copy of my book, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, for sure. Trying to make a sale. But, um, you know, or go to my blog, you know, because uh, it has a lot of the same information my book does because I didn't want to keep, it's not as well written and it doesn't have all the great stories, but it has a lot of the information and even more, like I say, because I couldn't, I didn't know and all that at the time I wrote it of the newer stuff. But the point is to educate them and get them on board because it will help their business because patients will say, look, this guy gets it because everybody's talking about vitamin D now, everybody because of COVID. And they realize there's something there as much as they tried to suppress it. And if mm. the doctor is saying, oh, no, it's nothing or whatever, they're going to look really, really bad. And mm. they're going to lose a lot of patients like that because they're going to lose their confidence because it is a real deal. You know mm. what I'm saying? Even if it's half as effective as I say it is, it's right. still what do you have to lose? Absolutely. And, and if someone is very, very prudent and very cautious, and they wanted to check their, their levels to see if they were becoming high, hypercalcemic. Um, how do they do that? And, and how do they, I mean, again, you've said it's so rare, but let's just play devil's advocate. Someone wants to check it and be sure. I think they should check it, okay? I think they should check their levels initially and check their levels as they progress. I mean, I, I think that's the wise thing to do. Even though yeah. it's super rare, you still don't want to be the person that has an issue, okay? And yeah. so, like in my book, and on my blog and, uh, you know, anybody I talk to is, you know, I make it clear I'm not giving medical advice and two, you know, work with your doctor. And, but if you can't or you won't, check your levels. And there's a, a site, Vitamin D Wiki, and it's a guy that, um, Dr. Lahore, uh, and he's got like 10 different companies that, that offer vitamin D, you know, testing. And what you want to check is the ionized calcium and the vitamin D and the parathyroid. Okay, and, and looking for abnormalities in all three. And, you know, what you're going to find is, and what I found is, and um, Ravi and I, um, um, Ravi Jolly, the Indian uh, scientist I told you about, kind of came up with this, is that um, it seems like hypocalcemia, if you have a normal functioning genes, is much more likely the hypocalcemia because mm -hmm. you know everybody says stay away from calcium rich foods and da 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 and that's why it's it's more complex and that's what makes it difficult to explain because i think if you're quote unquote normal 
you're going to be more prone to hypocalcemia. And yes, some people with a genetic defect or some gradation of that defect can be more prone to hypercalcemia. The vast majority of people are going to be more prone to hypo uh, or low normal calcium. And mm-hmm. ideally, you keep your level about 1.25. Uh, and I checked mine recently, it was 1.15 because I avoided calcium. I mean, this is brand new stuff. Right, right. Yeah. Um, I think I just hung on by my fingertips on that, what you were saying. Um, but if we Sorry. check our, ca- just keep an eye on the calcium levels um, and that yeah. should do it for most people, right? Right, right, right. 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 Sorry. I know that's a very oversimplification, no, but I don't think anyone's yeah. going to check out this guy you were talking about and look into, uh, you know, the other three and get different tests. Is it, is it, a, is it fair and safe to say that if people on a periodic basis, say two or three times a year, measured their vitamin D levels and they were between the, your recommendations of 100 to 140 nanograms per milliliter and they've got normal calcium levels, that they are in pretty good shape and, and if they feel okay. They're, they're perfect. Now, if they have some kind of disease and stuff, they may need higher doses. There's a Dr. Combra. I don't know if you're familiar with him, a Brazilian doctor, and he treats a lot of autoimmune diseases with very high dose um, uh, vitamin D. Um, maybe somebody to talk to. Um, oh. I think he's, um, well, I don't know. Um, I don't know if he's interested in the interview or not, <laughs> but um, he, um, and I haven't read his stuff because I, I, uh, I mean, I kind of have an idea, but I didn't want to be overly influenced by anybody else's thinking. Yes, yes. And so, because in school, a lot of times, you get so brainwashed into other people's, you don't even know that that one little fact is preventing you from understanding. And so that's why I kind of, you know, it's not perfect, but I found it works for me. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. Well, yes, that's, um, that's fascinating. All of this has been really, really fascinating. And uh, um, anyone who's interested in this should definitely go and buy your book. I found it, I found it really, really Interesting. Every time I jumped in my car, I would press play. I would listening to it at the gym between workouts. I mean, I found it uh, for someone who has a science background like myself. I found it really, really fascinating, uh, and it just makes sense that our recommended uh, daily requirement is just so low, based on common sense of how you described earlier in our chat. That just spending twenty minutes out in the sun in the middle of the day, you're going to get a roughly. 25,000 international units, and you're recommending that everyone should get 30,000 by supplement just to make sure uh, that we're doing something, you know, sensible. There's a lot of common sense in this. Exactly. Exactly. But, you know, they'd have you so afraid that, Hmm. you know, I mean, it's the politics of hobgoblins. They have us so afraid of everything. You know, we're going to end up all on every pharmaceutical under the sun. You know, personally, I don't want to have to, you know, do that. You know, I want to try to maintain as much health as I can. And that's what I'm I'm, trying to help everybody else do. I'm really glad you mentioned that because one person who I have recently recommended you and your work to, of which there's already been a lot, uh, said that he went to his pharmacist who said there was a contraindication with vitamin D dosing and his high blood pressure pills. So I'm really glad that you mentioned pharmaceuticals. Are there some contraindications that we really need to be careful of? Or is this something that's a little bit, you know, heavy handed again from pharmaceutical companies or from the medical community? Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. I was um, uh, overheard somebody conversing and they were saying, well, you know, toxic dose of vitamin D is 150 nanograms per ml. And uh, it's not, it's 300 is what they thought it might be, but probably closer to 400. And, and that's the people that have issues, I think. But um, yeah, I, I think people make up stuff all the time, even pharmacists. And I'm not aware, you know, I don't know everything, but I'm not aware of any medical contraindication to vitamin D3. You know, vitamin K with bleeding, you know, if you're on a blood thinner, that could be an issue. But vitamin D, no, no. Okay. No. All right. Absolutely fascinating. And again, as you said, none of this is medical advice. This is just your personal opinion, but I'm, you know, and, and 
But it's these kind of discussions that we need to have when we're facing a challenging disease and we're really, really looking for ways in which we can reduce the severity and how live a better life. And you're making a lot of sense around some really sort of simple fundamentals, which is, you know, we're not getting enough sunshine. Let's help our body achieve the body's performance that it would have should it be getting more sunshine. And you know, that's why I like it. That's why I really wanted to chat with you today. And we might get the odd person uh, a little bit uh, critical of this, but we're going to get thousands who say, thank you so much. This is fantastic. And they're the people that I'm thinking of, not the one or two people who are a little bit stuck in their ways or just don't want to consider this. And that's fine. Right. Well, I mean, I have a lot of respect for you. You went out and you found a way to get yourself better. And what I tell people is you need to, you know, listen to me, listen to you, listen to other people. You got to form what's best for you because only you know what's best for yourself. Get the best advice you can and go from there because some of the stuff I say, you may not get that same response or you may get more of a response, um, you know, and it may take some specific combination for you of multiple different things to get the best results. But if you don't educate yourself, you're then dependent on the medical industrial complex, which for sure will make sure you take lots of pharmaceuticals. (laughs) Correct. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Can you tell us uh, three things uh, where your clinic is so that people who are in Texas or in a nearby state can come to see you personally? how to get your book in a preferential way, and also uh, tell us about your blog. Well, I'm retired, so I'm not practicing anymore. Mm-hmm. And um, so, um, you know, some people had said I should set up courses and stuff like that. I, right now, I'm, I'm not interested in doing that, uh, maybe at some point in the future. But I think pretty much most of the stuff's out there, and I'm trying to educate doctors and everybody else to be able to do it, Okay. Uh, as far as my book, uh, they could get it on Amazon. They can also get it uh, Ingram Spark. That's like Barnes and Noble. Any bookstore carries it. Every bookstore carries it. So you could get it that way. And you had a third question. Was with regarding your blog? Oh, vitamindblog.com. And it's really my landing page. You go to the menu, come down, hit blog. And like I say right now, it's, it's doing um, the one on cancer. I'm working on the one on uh, gut health and stuff. The thing is, some of these more complex things take longer to really, you know, I start digging into it. And the next thing I know, I'll go, oh, my God, this is going to take a while to get it done. So, um, you know, it'll probably be a while after all the ones on cancer run, but I'm working on it, you know. Um, And the one you say you're working on is about the autoimmunity, isn't it? And gut health and, you know, basically your second brain and how critical vitamin D is to modulating that. It basically controls your gut. Mm, Could be worthy for another interview, maybe in six or 12 months from now, when you've got all that uh, more solidified, that'll be fascinating uh, to folks as well. So I would love uh, to do that because I'm working on my second book and that's going to be part of it. Ah, brilliant. Okay. That ties in perfectly. Well, as far as today goes, I'm very, very grateful for everything that we've covered. You've, you've given us so much to think about and um, you know, again, for people who are more interested in this, go and buy the book. It, I bought the Audible um, and I listened to it and it made it, it basically educated me without me setting aside any additional time. It's beautiful, beautiful listening to these audio, audio, Audible books. And that's how I uh, consume the information. It was great. And I want to thank you for all the work that you've done in this area. And, and uh, uh, I can't wait to get feedback from people who have consume this conversation and, uh, and, and go and get into these uh, supplements or to get more sunshine and measure their vitamin D levels regularly. And hopefully as a community, um, uh, you know, folks who are a part of my community can let me know and get feedback and we can share that with you and we'll see what happens when this starts to roll out. I would love to see that. And I really, really appreciate you inviting me to be here. I really enjoyed talking to you. You've got some great questions and hopefully it can help some people. Yeah, absolutely. All right, Judson, thank you so much. All right, Clint, thank you. Take care. 